Hi, welcome to my 2024 senior TED Talk. I want to start off by first asking you guys to think about or write down, I won't be asking you to share out, but what symbols and kind of words you associate with femininity. And then I'm going to ask you the same question, but about masculinity. And so the reason why I'm asking you this question is because I kind of want to see if you believe that this is based on a complete personal opinion and personal experiences, or if you think that it's kind of stemmed mostly from the influence of our society's kind of categorization of these things. And kind of show how we've been told a specific thing and how that is all we know, and so maybe it blinds us in some of other ways. And so this leads me into my research question, which is how Ezra Pound's portrait Dan Femme and Margaret Atwood's This is a Photograph of Me represent the modernist and postmodern depiction of societal gender roles. Kind of a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> so to go in chronological order here, I'll do Ezra Pound's Portrait Day and Femme first. And so before I go into that, I guess, I should go into what modernism is. And so modernism is a, or was a philosophical social movement that happened in the early 1900s through the 1960s and happened after World War I. And so naturally because of a world war, a lot of people's trust in institutions destabilized and kind of became fractured. And so a lot of people's kind of trust in institutions and morals and kind of traditional things kind of fell out. So it was all about social progression. It was all about finding hard truth, identifying what hard truth was. It was all about high culture, authority of criticism, casting this glorified and romanticized narrative of life to the side and focusing on this mundane reality of just regular human consciousness. Which brings me into Portrait Day and Femme. So translated to English, it's portrait of a lady or portrait of a woman, it could really be either. And the first line is, your mind and you are a Saragasso Sea. And Saragasso Sea is an actual place, <laughs> which I had to figure out. And so there's like some folk tales about it that kind of prove what he's trying to say with this. And it's kind of that there's a whole bunch of seaweed in this area and that it collects debris and accumulates you know, shipwrecks and trap ships and things of that nature. And so by him saying this about this woman, <laughs> it's kind of saying that she and her mind collect all these useless knowledge things and traps whatever she lures in, but holds no new, new important things or attributes to add to it. So I'm gonna go through kind of these three main modernist poetic themes that really help convey Pound's message throughout the poem. And so the first one is imagism, and it was actually like kind of a Ezra Pound influenced literacy movement. And so imagism sought clarity of expression through precise imaging. And so this line, pregnant with mandrakes or with something else that might prove useful yet never proves. And so the use of pregnant with mandrakes is an imagism kind of term to clarify a woman's weakness within a motherly role in society. And so using this phallic language that was very common for the modern male, it kind of proved as a dominance over the female figure and would belittle her value in, through these depictions and categorizations of very traditional female roles. And so what he's saying with this is like, even if you were to prove useful as a woman and bear a child, it wouldn't be enough to prove a sense of individuality or value within society, which is a great message. <laughs> so then there's fragmentation. And so I picked this stanza, which is, bright ships have left you this or that and fee, ideas, old gossip, oddments of all things, strange spars of knowledge, and dimmed wares of price. And so bright ships is representing these high cultured men that come and go through this woman's life because she's choosing to be an individual. And they come and go and she collects their fees, which is, you know, old gossip, used knowledge, dimmed materialistic things that she's grasping onto to kind of form a sense of identity within this society. And it kind of doesn't really prove anything because it's already been used or thought. And so her sense of value and identity are completely fragmented throughout this society within the things that she tries to collect and claim as her own. And in reality, she's just kind of scattered by society. And so then I move to realism, and this is a very modern-esque kind of poetic theme. It's, oh wow, that goes really fast. 
Okay, <laughs> it's a very like modernist poetic theme, and it means kind of the mundane reality of human consciousness. So kind of referencing back to that modernist theme. And so you've been second always. Tragical? No. You prefer it to the usual thing, one dull man, doling and luxurious, one average mind with one thought less each year. So this woman is put second, but she doesn't mind whatsoever because if she did decide to be prioritized or first, she would have to settle down on one dull man. And so the use of realism is kind of addressing this Western civilization kind of traditional social construct that's being pushed onto this woman. But interesting enough, it kind of mocks the marriage role itself. So it's mocking her for rebelling against it and choosing individuality. But it's also mocking the narrative and being like, well, maybe this isn't what women want because it's a dull man who gets duller every year. So this brings me to Pound's meaning. And I really <laughs> wish that I could go into like the whole thing in my thesis because it would make a lot more sense. But this is what I have to do for now. So um, it's, first of all, illustrating the Western civilization and modern modernist gender narratives being challenged and kind of the repercussion that that had for men against women and the depiction of women in this time. And the modern maleness, which is a funny word, is actually a word I found a lot within my research. And it's kind of representing the modern male's kind of privilege to play femininity and depict the female figure in mind through the male gaze only. And so it's kind of addressing this alienating power shift dynamic that was happening during this period with the fall of Western civilization and then kind of this rise of a woman's individuality in society. So this woman is fragmented between being an individual and also kind of dealing with these really aggressive depictions and narratives of where she should be. And eventually kind of has no identity within it all. To totally slingshot you in a different direction, <laughs> I have marked her out, which this is a photograph of me. And once again, I need to provide a little bit of context. And so she was part of the postmodern era. <laughs> and this started in world, well, after World War II, and it happened from 1960s to, and this is a really hot debate, and we don't need to get into it, but to now-ish. And so Naturally, again, similar thing that happened with modernism, a world war caused a giant stagger and kind of shattered within people's beliefs. But a quote that I actually found within my research was that modernity is pregnant with its postmodernity. So that means that like all of the ideologies and theories of modernism were kind of challenged and almost reversed in postmodernism. So who cares for social progression? Meaning is completely relative, things are subjective meaning, or pop culture, <laughs> what even is truth, what identifies truth, why is truth important, and quite literally, anything and everything goes. Which brings me into, this is a photograph of me. And so this first stanza kind of sets up the poem, and this was actually the first photo that came up when I looked up the poem. So I thought it would be a nice visual for you guys. But um, this is the intro, and then once again, I'm gonna go over these three kind of post-modern structures that she has throughout this. The first being unreliable narrator, which is a little self-explanatory, but it's an untrustworthy storyteller. And so when we read stories and when we watch movies, we're heavily depending on the narrator of the movie and story. And so throughout this stanza, you can see that the, in the left-hand corner, there's a thing that is like a branch, and that you can't decide what type of branch it is. And then there's also this bottom one that's halfway what ought to be a gentle slope. So with these kind of uncertain words, this indicates that she is lacking a huge sense of confidence and certainty within herself and her surroundings. And this symbolizes kind of the suppression of the female voice within society because she isn't confident within herself and thus cannot tell her story. This brings me to distortion. And this is a huge part of this poem in a very postmodern structure. So it was when an author kind of twists an idea or thing within their narrative. And so once again, we're you know, being brought through this thing in some low hills, and then there's this really dramatic line break of the photograph was taken the day after I drowned. And so suddenly, all the focus is on the in sudden introduction of a floating dead woman in the middle of this photograph. And it causes a distortion for us as the reader, but also throughout the narrative, and makes us kind of question and shatters all of our previous assumptions of what this poem could mean. And 
so Atwood uses this to kind of represent how this is an interpretation of a very curated version of what this photograph could be. And so it's kind of representing like whoever took the photograph, which is not the dead woman, obviously, <laughs> has the power to kind of drown out people's voices. It's just kind of a bad pun, but anyway. <laughs> and so this is kind of symbolizing how a woman's voice and character and figure and everything were super suppressed by the male gaze and the male voice. This brings me to naturalism. And so I guess you can't really tell, but the, the poem introduces na naturalistic aspects first to kind of represent this aspect of how society looks to men first before women. And so, <laughs> and so naturalism is using this, and so I would kind of use this ideology of culture to nature to men to women to kind of represent how this was looked at second. And so, very end. Just that. And so this brings me to Atwood's meaning. And so first and foremost, it represents the oppression of marginalized female voice and expression within the male-dominated society. And Atwood's structure, if you think about the time period of this, was kind of during the second wave of feminism. And so a lot of female poets strive to create new archetypes for women, by women, and kind of correct, let's say Pounds, for example, uh, depiction and kind of narration of what a woman should be. And so what her poem is kind of saying is that a female's value and position within a male-dominated society is so suffocated by that that eventually it just suppresses any outlet of authentic representation of femininity, and she eventually drowns in it. So I decided to kind of contrast these last two stanzas, because interesting enough, they kind of validate each other, but also contradict each other at the same time. And so Pound's last stanza conveys that despite this woman's constant wanting to collect things and materialistic things and knowledge throughout the years, the woman is still alone and lacks a true sense of self. And the mocking ending kind of strives to throw in her face that she's kind of built in the world around her and has a real sense of individuality as a woman. And it's kind of like, you can stuff everything you want to mask, mask your own emptiness, but in reality, it's nothing of your own, and so you ultimately don't have an identity. And so Atwood's, it's contradictory to this because she overpowers the narrative with naturalism to you know, display our society's favor to men. And on the last stanza, she proves our initial inability to ever really see this woman for who she is. And by only stepping out of our own socially constructed kind of perspectives of what gender is supposed to be, or what a woman is supposed to be in society and accepting her voice and her point of view, will we be able to see her and she will reveal herself. But the hard kind of aspect of this is that she's been dead and that she's already been dead for a long time and yet she's still trying so hard to be heard and to be seen, which represents a lot about our society. And so why is this important? Why should you care? Why is this interesting at all? Not only is it just the building blocks of how our entire like literature and <laughs> you know society depict women and write things and communicate how we feel about certain things, looking at both of these timeline-based biased gender depictions is really huge because we can see the societal constructs that have created and morphed the illustration of a woman's role and value within society. And it acts as a reference as to why and how we have created the certain narratives and kind of depictions that we have, which is, I think, really interesting. So this brings me to my conclusion. And so I have my thesis statement first, which is, you know, how did these exactly depict gender? And so Ezra Pound's poem represents the Western civilization and how male conservatism kind of segregated gender narratives in the modernist period. And Atwood completely contradicts this by expressing the marginalized oppression of female voices and expression during the rise of feminist poets in the postmodern era. And so Ezra Pound and Margaret Atwood have illustrated these two suppressed female voices and senses of self throughout society from very different time periods. And yet they have the very similar kind of narrative of gender. 
And it kind of shows how these societal constructions on gender dynamics divide and oppress our culture, and ultimately the bias of the male position over any representation of realistic femininity. Thank you. All right.